In 1985, I escaped from death row and was on the FBI's most wanted list for 25 days. I was being escorted to a hearing for a new trial, and I was all excited about getting that. And we stopped to use the toilet. And when I went to the urinal, the officer with me in a freezing cold, snowy night had to go to the toilet. He left me to run back to the car alone, and his partner didn't know that. His partner back at the car saw me running at him and thought, he got my partner. So he pulls out a, a nine and starts blasting at me. From the age of 21, I went in. The average rate of survival was five years. Most men killed themselves or died of other things. I lasted 12 years, man. I mastered it. Welcome back to the Blue Tick Show. Opposite me today, I've got Nick Yaris, the man who spent 23 years in prison and escaped death row. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Mikey. I appreciate being here, man. Guys, before we jump into this video, I want you to scroll down right now. Hit that subscribe button. Over 90% of you haven't subscribed. Scroll down, hit the subscribe button, and make sure while you're at it, you hit the like button too. I'll see you soon. Finally got it locked in, and you're here today. Listen, Nick, you've got a story which I don't think any of the viewers have heard before. So talk to us, run us through your childhood a little bit, run us through what took, the events that took place in your life and what's brought you here today. Okay, so I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which is like two hours from New York City. And in 1968, when I was a young boy, I had my head bashed in and I got raped by a man in my neighborhood and he threw my life into chaos. You know what I mean? Just total anger. I had to start wearing glasses. I uh, I was that kid that was always acting out in the classroom. How you old know? was you at that age? Eight, seven. Eight year, seven yeah. years old, wow. So it really affected everything about my life and my development because he lived nearby and I was always afraid. So I found myself becoming really aggressive and I couldn't understand that. And then I got hooked on alcohol at the age of 10. So from the age of 10 till 14, it was marijuana and alcohol every day as much as I could, progressing into pills. And then finally, I got hooked on methamphetamine. And, and that's just, from the age of 10 to 14? Yeah, from 10 to 14, alcohol and weed. And then from 17 on, I was just... And your parents during this stage? Yes, yeah, so that's the sad part. My family was trying very hard to hold things together. My mother and father both worked. My grandmother ran the household, and I had five siblings. Oh, wow, big family. And everyone was doing drugs. Oh, wow. So that didn't make it easier at all, because if everyone was doing it. It was the 70s, it. do you know what I mean? So the bad thing was I had this terrible secret inside me and it just made me tear away from believing in anything. I kept hating God. I kept hating myself. I picked fights with bigger boys because I wanted someone to end me. It's true. Like I, I, I think about it now. The things that I used to do didn't make any sense. And then at the age of 19, I got diagnosed finally by being put into a mental institution in Florida and I got diagnosed with aphasia, and I didn't understand what it meant. What is that? You ever see somebody stutter? Yeah. That's a mild form of it. Okay. The brain's not working in unison with your vocal cords, so you can't keep up where you didn't, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mine would get, in times of stress, so bad, my left eye would shut down, and I wouldn't be able to handle conversation. I couldn't let you finish saying anything. Do you know what I mean? Okay, yeah, yeah. And I had immediate in, uh, gratification issues. I was really chaotic, and I would just explode for no reason. So, do you think that comes back to trauma as a kid? Yeah, is that what getting, that is from? Yeah, from getting hit in the head with that stone. So, I come back from there, and I'm I'm afraid to get high again. I actually, was stable for a really cool period. In 1981, where I got a job in Philadelphia, I started dating this girl. I felt good about myself because I wasn't, a, I wasn't like... Addicted to anything. Yeah, I would smoke a little weed, I would drink some beer, but I wouldn't get high on meth, right? I broke up with her, hung out with this dude, did a line of meth, it all started. I got chased in a car in Philly, 
and the police caught me and beat me all up, and charged me with assault and everything. I get out on bail, go back to my parents' house, and my mouth's all bashed up. So I spent like a good 10 days in my parents' bedroom up in their house, you know, just like getting high, getting angry, lost. I went out on December 20th, 1981, and I stole a car. Later that night, a police pulled me over in a city called Chester, and I went through a stop sign. Yeah. When I pulled over, this time I'm afraid to run. I don't want to make that mistake of running and getting beaten again. You know, my mouth's just now healing from a terrible beating. And because I have aphasia from getting my head beaten and I'm high as shit, I just froze, like hold the wheel, and I can't hear nothing. I don't even know the radio's blasting. Yeah. I'm so high and out of it, you know what I mean? He rips the car door open, he snatches me out, throws me against the car and starts choking me with his forearm. I'm like, oh my God. So I, I slipped like, my arm under and I knocked his hand away. And the next thing you know, he, he going for his stick. I crowd the stick out of his hand like he was a child. He couldn't believe this. This dude was big too. Yeah. So he tries to grab his gun. I seen him, I, I saw what he was gonna do. He was gonna reach down and pull that pistol out and I just followed down with both hands and put my hands on the top of his wrist and pushed downwards and that's when the gun went off. So that's what changed my life right there. I went from being a 20 year old drug addict who stole a car to now this cop pulls the gun back, sticks it under my chin, puts me in the car while yelling at me and then he did this crazy thing where he sat there for a minute in the front seat and he looked at me in the rear view mirror like he was thinking about it and he grabbed the microphone and he started shouting, shots fired, shots fired, officer assist, help, help, he's attacking me. Like it's still going on, man. What's going on guys? If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you scroll down. We're now live on Spotify so you can watch us while you're driving, listen to us, listen to us while you're in the gym. Pretty much just listen to us anywhere and make sure you give us a five star review on Spotify. Thank you. Wow. I'm like, you dirty bastard. What are you doing, man? He said, you motherfucker. You like, and put the boat. And now he's standing outside the car and he's walking back and forth. He's getting it together. He's thinking about it. They come roaring up to the scene. Where is he at like that? Oh, I got him. I got him. He had the gun in my face. I, I'm like, what? He starts telling him that instead of what I just told you happened, that when I pulled over and he pulled up behind me for going through a stop sign, I jumped out of my car. I ran back to, to his car before he had a chance. I pulled him out of his car. I punched him in his face. I broke his eyeglasses. I had his gun before he knew it, and I was whipping him with it when I pulled him back towards my car to kill him when he overpowered me and took the gun. Such sneaky fuckers. Man. I took the jail. I got taken into the jail, charged with attempted murder and kidnapping of a police officer. They charged you as well. Yeah, so I was standing there next to a public defender at 3 o'clock in the morning, and the dude turned to me and said, you're going to be put away for life for this. You know that, right? It's his word against yours. I can't help you. It's four days before Christmas. I just had a sober period. I was proud of myself, and in two weeks of getting high, I ruined it all. Man, I'm like, oh, no. So... Is this your first time going to prison now? For serious crime. I'd yeah. always had some petty crime. Yeah. You know what I mean? A car thief, a drug addict, nothing violent. I yeah. ain't never robbed nobody, you know? So they put me in a cell by myself and I crashed and I went through detox without any treatment and I lost my mind. I slept for three days, you know? And I remember waking up and there was a newspaper in my cell and in the newspaper front page was a uh, gone. The second page that was there was about a mystery of a murder in the area about a woman that was abducted in the state of Delaware and they found her in Pennsylvania and it was like, can you help us? And that would just torment me every time I opened my eyes. You know, it's the only thing to read, you know? I kept sitting there thinking, I'm in prison and they're going to take my life because of a lie. What if I made up a lie about something like that and just made up a different lie and got my life back? 
And like that, in a 20-year-old junkie's mind, I made up a stupid lie saying that a dude that had robbed me and actually rolled me up in a rug and tried to murder me had told me he had did that crime. And I tried to barter my way out of these bogus charges. So they take me out of my cell, I swear to God. They take me to the warden's office. They buy me a Coca-Cola and tell me they're going to make a deal with me. They said that they talked to my arresting officer and he's going to reduce my charges to resisting arrest. And in three days, I can go home if what I'm telling him is true. What? That's It's madness. all in the records. It's all in the records, right? Three days go by. Nothing. They came back to me. They said, come on with us. We're going back down to the CID's headquarters so you can make a statement. They set me up. I'm thinking, I'm going to make my little statement. I'm getting out. I get down to the headquarters. They sat me down and they said, right, why did you kill this lady? I said, what? They said, look, the reason that you came forward is we know that you had mental problems your whole childhood and that you just had a breakup with your girlfriend. So we know that you went out and killed that lady because she looks like your girlfriend. I was like, what? So, like, so you, what? So from you going to make a lie to get out of prison, they now think they're now accusing you of killing this person. No, they made up their mind that I did it. Wow. They sincerely believed that I did the murder. I kept telling them I didn't And do this it. is of the woman of the newspaper. Yeah. A woman named Linda May Craig was abducted at the Tri-State Mall in Delaware and driven into Pennsylvania next door, and her body was found behind a church. I had nothing to do with it. I lived almost 30 miles away. I was a 20-year-old drug addict who was trying to barter my way out of a lie. The detectives decided that since I played this vicious game with them, they said, they're going to just do me. So when they got me back to the prison that night, they did the sinister thing of doing this. The lead detective, Randy Martin, said, oh, watch this, to his partner. And I was like, didn't understand what he was talking about. They took my handcuffs off in the holding cells, and he gave me a big hug, and he said, thanks for that information, Nick. We're going to go kick some doors in. Over his shoulder is four members of the Pagan's motorcycle gang on my block. When I go back to the block, nothing happens. The next morning, a dude tried to put my eye out with a sharpened broom, and then he threw a cup of bleach with urine in my face and tried to blind me. Then they started attacking me. Wow. They thought I was an informant. So they put a guy in the cell next to me named Charles Catalino. He was convicted of burglarizing the local prosecutor's home. You feel me? He was convicted of it by a jury, and he's facing 20 years at that moment when they came to him and said, Charles, we need you to do us a favor. This kid won't crack. We got him getting beat up every day by the uh, bikers. He's hung himself in prison. He's still hanging in there. We need you to say he confessed to you. <laughs> he's like, deal. Sweet, I'm here for 20 yeah, years. He's a heroin anyway. addict. So this dude gets put into the cell next to me for one day and then gets moved out of there. And then the next day I'm charged with the rape and murder of Linda May Craig, a woman I never met in my life. Wow. That's how you know the justice system is, is no justice. It's not the justice system. It's the evil people who work within systems to hurt human beings. Let's always forget that the system itself is designed for good. It's the evil within the system Not that really. does. Because this is why I could move on. At the time that I was in prison, there was two million people in prison. You understand? Yeah. So it wasn't personal. Yeah. Yeah. That's when a great look, perspective. When, yeah, well, I was just saying, but it took me a at... long time to get there. But we'll get there. Okay. So now I'm charged with the rape and murder of a woman I never met. The cop took back his grace statement and said, no, no, he tried to murder me. So now I get put on trial for the uh, original charges against a police officer in 1982. A jury finds me not guilty of all charges against that police officer in 15 minutes. A jury done that? Because usually you get juries that are a little bit, they always defend the but police. But he blew it. 
Og han blev det. He made up this big story, didn't he? Yeah. He wanted to be the hero. He took a photograph of his hand to show the jury where I took the gun off him. But what did I tell you, Mikey? He said I punched him. Yeah. He said Broke I took the gun and hit him in the face with it. My lawyer asked him one question. If you took a photograph of your hand to show why you were damaged, why didn't you take a photograph of where he punched you and knocked your eyeglasses off? Yeah. Dude gave it up. So the jury found me not guilty. The prosecutor exploded in the courtroom, threw the file against the room, started going crazy saying, you're never leaving this county alive. He had nothing to do with my homicide trial. But because he lost that trial, he took over the homicide case the next week and started seeking the death penalty. I'm 20 years old. And they're allowed to do that. Don't, ain't there like some sort of... Back then it was all wild, wild west, baby. The president of the United States got shot in 1981 by a mentally ill man. I'm being charged not with a crime, but for being a mentally ill stalker. So it's all open game. Yeah. In the prison, dudes are trying to make bank off me. There's a 10 grand bounty on me. Yeah. So I'm every day in there hooking and fighting. You understand me? Every day's warfare. All right. In the courts, it's even worse because now they went from that give him a fair trial shit. They set up my next trial right before the Independence Day weekend, knowing that jury don't want to be there. Yeah. And the opening statement from the judge was this. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, thank you for your service to the community. I promise you that I know every one of you has a huge grave concern about this week. But I want you to know, none of you will miss the holiday weekend. I'm going to have this trial over in the next three days. This video is sponsored by Cranbrook Law, an award-winning immigration law firm. Their talented solicitors can help when any struggles arise regarding immigration law. They can help get you the visas they need. They can help get you the staff you need from any other countries. As you can see, the website is on the screen right now. So if you need anything to do with immigration law, message Cranbrook Law and let them help you. Whether you're looking to obtain a sponsor license, receive advice and guidance in relation to compliance and our civil penalties, or take advantage of our know-how and experience across a broad range of business visas, our talented and dynamic immigration lawyers are available to speak to you. Telephone numbers on the screen, emails on the screen, and hit the link in the bio if you need any help that was the start of my murder homicide trial for capital murder okay so how did they convict me they got the junkie on the stand and said i confessed to him the killer has b positive blood back then that's all they could do with blood work and serology so i have b positive blood and they showed pictures to the jury of the little boys finding that woman behind the church God got so angry at him, I swear to God, he struck the courthouse with a bolt of light and knocked the power out when they did that. You could look it up. And it's crazy because wow. the woman was laying in the snow and her blood was everywhere. They went up to it to see what it was in the snow. They kicked the, what they thought was a mannequin to see if it was a male or female mannequin only to find that it was Mrs. Craig's body. Then they scattered in the snow away from each other in an arc. And even though the photograph was in black and white, you could see the bloody footprints of the children looking like the wings of an angel. Wow. After they showed that to the jury, God hit the courthouse with a bolt of lightning. Wow. They, they took me out of the courtroom like it was an escape attempt. Like they're all scared of me. I'm like, What? it's not me. They take me upstairs and I'm looking out over this huge courtroom, uh, court uh, yard out. And they, all these people came out of the buildings because there's no power. So I was looking down on them. And I knew I wasn't going to die. God told me to go back and look them in the eye. It's a, it's a historical fact. When I was being sentenced to die, nobody could look me in the face. And the judge said, do you have anything else to say? And I said, yes, sir, you can go to hell. That's all they put in the paper. But the truth is, God told me to look them in the face because none of them could look me in the eye. So they sent me from there to Huntington State Prison 
the hardest prison in America because they didn't even have a death row back then. They put me in a punishment unit where they was breaking men. So the first two years of my sentence, I had to do in silence. I wasn't allowed to speak. Nothing. You were not allowed to talk at all. If you broke the silence rule, four men put on riot gear and then they put a helmet, like a football helmet, on a nurse and she put on a flak vest and got a big needle and ran in behind them and stabbed you in the ass with the needle full of Thorazine. So you didn't break the, the silence fuck? rule. That's not prison, that's torture. That's why they shut it down, but listen to this. But if you broke that rule, then they put you in the glass bubble. So they had a, a cell made out of glass bricks. And they could see inside of it and keep the lights on 24 hours a day. And they made you stand up every 15 minutes for a head count until you just lost your mind. Want to play with them? That's not, see, that's not even a, it's not even a joke. That's... I was 20, 22 years old. From, from the age of 21, I went in. The average rate of survival was five years. Most men killed themselves or died of other things. I lasted 12 years, man. I mastered it. And what do you think gave you the power to survive that? Because love. obviously... Love is the only thing you will go through everything in your life for. It will shape you into the most fierce warrior and make you the kindest person. It took a lot of violence for me to become a very passive, kind person. Was it everyday trouble inside? Yeah, so I saw my first murder within weeks of being in prison. I lived through a riot. In 1985, I escaped from death row and was on the FBI's most wanted list for 25 days. How did you escape? I was being escorted to a hearing for a new trial, and I was all excited about getting that. And we stopped to use the toilet. And when I went to the urinal, the officer whipped me in a freezing cold, snowy night had to go to the toilet. He left me to run back to the car alone and his partner didn't know that. His partner back at the car saw me running at him, thought he got my partner. So he pulls out a, a nine and starts blasting at me. So you was actually running towards the car or you was- Freezing to death. And, and Mikey, I can't see anything because my eyeglasses fogged up. I was in a warm car. I got out in the snow. So you wasn't court. actually trying to run away? I, I'm going to court to get a new trial. Oh, wow. So, and he, but he fired a shot at my head and I turned around I'm like I'm not taking chances yeah, and I'm, paranoia that. kicks in so yeah I ran and then I did the Philly boy trick I ran about 100 yards I ran another 100 yards I ran 100 yards I hid behind their car and I waited for them to stop arguing and stuff while I took the handcuffs off and then where did you so I you hid behind a police station for two hours <laughs> Yeah, in plain man. sight. Come on, I'm Philly. I'm I'm still a street kid at that time. I'm 24 years old. I'm now on the FBI's most wanted list for being an escaped death row murderer. Yeah, that's not a joke. This ain't no joke. A helicopter catches up to me and he chases me for four hours, man. I ran through the woods without care what it was doing to me. It ripped me up, man. I ended up going underneath the fence and going down these tracks in the snow and being buried by so much snow, he flew over me, couldn't find me, got up, shook all the snow off and walked on the railroad tracks for five miles till I stole a car and went to New York City. So, so I ended you, up- How did you get caught? Cool? I turned myself in. You did, yeah? I knew I couldn't do this to my family or myself. I didn't kill anybody. and. All my heart, I swear to God, all I wanted to do was like somehow walk into a TV station and say, listen to this, but who's going to give me a chance? I'm 24. I don't really think I'm capable mentally to handle this. I better go back. So they put me on death row in Florida. I end up spending eight months next to coward ass Ted Bundy, getting shipped back to from Florida to Pennsylvania and... I went on a mission. I ruined my appeals. I had 105 years of the death uh, of sentences on top of the death penalty. So I went on this mad mission to read all of the world's religions. 
And the crazy thing is, when I finished doing that, I got a newspaper handed to me, and I became the first person in America on death row to seek DNA testing to prove my innocence. It was like a gift. You were the first ever person? Yeah, on death row. Wow, that's amazing. In February of 1988, in the United States, I became the first United States death row prisoner to seek DNA testing. Are you allowed to do that? Is that not- yeah, that was, that was all brand new science. It was never even used at that time. It was so new. I became pen pals with Sir Alec Jeffries, the man who invented it here in Leicestershire. So a lot of people don't know that DNA testing came from right here in Leicester. So there was a murder committed of a woman in the Leicestershire area. Dr. Alec Jeffries took blood samples from men in a certain age group from the whole county and proved with the first ever DNA testing that it was a man named Colin Pitchfork who had committed the murder against this woman. And then it went wild. Right? I sat there, Mikey, and I watched a hundred other people go free and twelve others from death row walk free while they tried to murder me. They destroyed all the evidence, man, and they kept trying to destroy the evidence. They kept destroying the evidence. I met a woman and got married to her. I was married to her for nine years and she was helping me on the outside with my DNA efforts. They when they spilled the last of the evidence, she left. Do you know what I mean? It was getting bad. Then, in retaliation for the escape, they beat me for four minutes, so I got hepatitis C from the dentist, and I was dying. So in 2002, I asked to dismiss my lawyers and give up my appeals and ask to be executed, and that's how I got the DNA. So they gave you the DNA thing then? I forced them. God made them come through for me. I told you, it's real, man. This isn't something I could make up. I have to believe in God. There's no possible way you could look up on a screen and see the image of an angel in the children's feet of blood and watch the courthouse get hit by lightning and you it's nothing. What, it didn't happen? Come on, man. And then, after they proved me innocent so what that's what i want to understand so when obviously the dna come out and it proved your innocence it took them eight months to let me go from so, there they were so afraid of me man and in the end you know they even botched my release that morning they put me in a van drove me up to the gates to the prison and said goodbye to me and they said oh man we messed up no way and i handled it because my mom and dad's out there i did it for love it was a hard journey in so many difficult ways, but it was so beautiful to learn so much about yourself as a man, to witness things you never thought you could endure and grow from them. So, blessedly, when I got out, my mother sat me down on my second day of freedom and she said, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to be a polite man, a respectful man, to show respect for this family, what's been done to us. I didn't know that was the beautiful set of keys to my own healing because that's neuroplasticity. That's how you heal. When you go out every day and you're super polite and you really make the effort, it doesn't matter about the other person. Your brain is forgetting about A, B, and C of negative. And it's rewriting itself with A, B, and C, a beautiful positivity. Okay. In the 19 years that I've been free, I've had not one psychological counseling session for my mental health. That's, that's, for what you've gone through, the fact, forget about everything for one second. The fact you can sit opposite me today and have a normal conversation, and if I didn't know your past, I wouldn't, you wouldn't know it. That's exactly what I strive for. Is insane. That in itself is is mental. Forget the story for a minute. If even now when you're telling me, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, what the fuck? Like some people would probably commit suicide after what they've been through. They would not even be able to have a conversation with people. 
and they would just probably be paranoid, schizophrenic, like lose their head. You're normal. I, I don't see anything That's different with you. Because I work so hard at understanding this, Mikey. I really am living proof. I've erased my own PTSD from my childhood traumas, from my drunken, debaucherous natures, all of my self-hating, all of my violence. I've erased it with kindness. This video is sponsored by Everything Education. Everything Education is English, maths, and science classes. So if you need them in person or virtual online, they can do both. So whatever suits your preference, message them, and I'm sure they'll find a solution that works around you. And how have you, of course you need some sort of power, not power, but some sort of inner will to do that. Because no, you just have to love. Is it in your nature to love? Yeah, of course. It's in every And nature, every time that you fight against your nature, you ruin every molecule of your body. It's in your nature to love. You know what that saying, love thy enemy? It's not the Christian Judeo sense that I look at it. It's having a lo enough love about everything so that I can pity or empathize my person of woe, I call them. They're not my enemy. You, you're not able to be my enemy because I can't allow you that status in my heart. You're that person of woe. And as such, whatever woes that you have that are driving you mad that you got to be nasty to me, I forgive you. And how did you learn to understand that? Because, of course, that takes a certain... That doesn't happen overnight. No. I had one officer in particular spit in my food for almost three years. Wow. He tried to use other prisoners to murder me. He thought I had offended him. How can you break that man? He's going to hate you. Drive yourself mental with feelings about it. Drive yourself mad with the need to get revenge or understand it. Maybe mommy didn't have a nice nipple and he had a bad life. And <laughs> See, I got you. <laughs> what did you do? Love. Brilliant. So I made this beautiful, eloquent joke of it. Most days that I spent of the 8,057 days that I was in solitary confinement, I wasn't inside my cell. How'd you work that one out? Because mentally I wasn't there. I read 9,400 books before I stopped counting. 9,400 books? University level studies of, of psychology for six years. Proficient in writing legal form so I can get other men off of death row. If you had problems on death row and you couldn't write to your mom or articulate things to your lawyer, I'd help you. I love you. I don't care that you killed someone. Want to know why? Because it's not for me to judge. I got blessed. I would be in a cell next to a man sometimes, and I would spend years next to this man and never see his face. And then upon exiting the cell, be shocked that he wasn't who he made him out to be. And like a blind person, I have this beautiful gift to get to know someone from their voice and their their mannerisms without seeing them. It's mad though, it is, it's... I grew up, Mikey, you ready? I am the first person ever to circumnavigate the globe while sitting on death row by sending snippets of my hair all over the world to pen pals and asking them to put them into the seven seas because I found out about DNA. If I was going to live then I had to learn to live anywhere. Yeah. So I lived brilliantly and beautifully and alive, even on death row. But and how long into your death row, how long into death row did you start to make that transition into being that more positive a person? After I read all of the world's religions, it made me so humbled to know I could be so right and so wrong at the same time. And through reading all the religious books, did you not turn to a certain religion? I did the smartest thing that I thought was possible. I stole every good from like each one, from every which one, and conglomerated them into this beautiful knowledge that I am a child of God and I am energy.
And as long as I am sweet of nature and kind to others, I do no wrong, then that positive energy cannot be wrong. And wherever God takes me on this journey, I'm willing to pay the tolls now. I understand what it's like to be a beautiful, kind Hindu, a beautiful, kind Muslim, a beautiful, kind judeo Christian, Christian. Do you know what I mean? I understand what it means to be them. I want to be all of you. I want to be attached to all of you, so I accept all of you. I love it that I spent the time to read the Quran four separate times, right to left, because I fell in love with so many of the notions about the dutifulness of good. Yeah, and like I said, my good friend Anthony Samandani and I talked about this, but the Muhammad Ali bracelet says, within good there is God. And that was Ali saying, you know, the greatest boxer of all time. Yeah. He knew it. So I got out of death row. I'm living in Philadelphia where there's murders everywhere. And how was that first, like, just your first month, if you can run back to it, what was that like being out, finally being free? Did you feel free or did you, or were you still trapped in your head? A part of me wanted the Pollyannish, beautiful, sweet, everything's wonderfully alive against the reality of total dysfunction, living in the ghetto, no resources. I'm still sick with hepatitis. I don't even know if I can make it as long as they said they said I had to be on a liver transplant within three years when I first got out, stuff like that. So it was kind of hard, but I was so clever. I sat in my parents' basement, and within only a few months of being released from death row, I was here in England speaking to a joint session of the combined lower house of parliament. <laughs> The UN Secretary General of the time, Kofi Annan, walked up to me in conclusion of my speech and said, sir, you are one of the finest speakers I've ever heard in my life. Yeah? I was 10 months out of a death row cell, man. I knew I had changed. I knew I had an ability, but God had other plans. You see, the reason I never became the huge success that I could be at that time and on forward, I don't think people could embrace my message until I lived out here long enough and I struggled out here long enough for them to truly believe that this is real, that I am okay mentally. So since I've been released from prison, I've been a millionaire, I've been impoverished, I've had a child die in my arms. I've lost everything. I've gone through separation and losing my children, separation and losing my wife and children. I gave away everything at the beginning of this year. I came back to England and as I sit before you, I have no bank account, I have no address, and I'm just starting over, but I'm nailing it because this is no different than death row to me. I can handle anything. I'm yeah. bulletproof, man. Listen, if you can do death row, then I'm, this is a walk in the park. This is nothing for you. This is why I told you, Mikey, this was going to be so good to come and talk to you now. Because you're witnessing me just before I go sit on this morning and talk about my platform and the book I wrote, The Kindness Approach, and helping people mentally not kill themselves. We have the highest rate of suicide in university in England right now, ever. We have the highest rate among the working class, ever, of suicide. Come on, man. This is time for people who have been through trauma to share the trauma, to give others hope. Yeah. When people find out what I've gone through, they really do want to find that thing that's in me within them so that they can be that for mom and dad, so that they can hold on for the ones that they love. I went through being sentenced to death and humiliated and put through an enormous challenge. 
for the love of my family and the par people that I cared about. As long as you can find someone to love other than yourself, you can go so much further than what you feel for yourselves. That's our nature. But when you get to my level where you can do this because you love yourself so much for what you did to bring you here now, I love me for what I've done so far. I respect me for not turning bleak and violent. I can love myself now. Of course. That's brilliant, Mikey. I, I never got to feel love for myself until I was tortured. It, it, I, the thing is, I don't... I, you're the first person I've interviewed where I'm so eager to drop this episode just for people to listen to it because it's not even to hear your story but to understand how because there's many people out here nowadays who are stressed over little things in life we people worry about paying their bills paying this doing that their family someone's anything I want a new car you've been through really bad times yeah I don't want to say the worst because people have had other stories as well and I'm who am I to say what's worse or not it's true but you sit opposite me with a smile on your face saying, Mikey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it. And even before this podcast started, you sat there and said, I'm going to do it. And I, I don't doubt it. I, I, how can I doubt you when you've been through all of that and you're still here sitting opposite me and you're sitting and saying, yeah, watch, I'm going to do it. And I think that, like you said, you love yourself, is amazing. If you believe in God, why are you afraid? That's you know no just fear. just that you said that yeah so every single I'd say once a week I post that motto to my Instagram really yeah you haven't I don't think we followed each other long I, enough I saw your podcast clips but I know it's funny I it's, didn't know that so every single week that is my motto I live by if you believe in God why are you worried why are and you, yeah I have no fears and I only turned religious about a year ago and I my whole life has How about, changed can you stop saying that. You're religious about washing I your only, face. Of no. course. I only started this? following... Uh-uh. I've tapped into my spirituality recently. Okay. It's more encompassing and it's more true about yourself. Yeah. Because your religiosity is could be washing your hands. Yeah. That's what, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. But your spiritual development is awakening. And no other time could we have probably met like this and you felt all this without that. A hundred percent. Everything is all about timing. I know. And from that, I'm not joking, but I saw that quote, the first, I say, week into this, I saw that quote and I thought, that's so true. If I believe in God, why am I worried? And I've even saved it on my phone. And every time I'm not even feeling down or having a bad day or just some shit's not going right. I sit there, I read back to it and I say, okay, shut up, Mikey. What are you worrying for? He's got a big, the plans. his plan's always the greatest plan. And I think people struggle with one thing. They take negatives as a total. And I'll give you an example. I couldn't be sitting here before you beautifully, eloquently speaking if I had been immediately rewarded and welcomed into an open, loving family that was all perfect, per pitch perfect, and I go off in the sunshine. Yeah. My message is gone. Yeah. When I started to realize God had a plan for me, that my suffering was the beauty of others' hope. Think about that. My suffering became others the beauty of their hope i accepted it yeah and when i accepted it i can show you message after message on my phone from all around the world and invariably they're thanking me they don't get it yet they're, they're thanking me for being like them mm -hmm. and i remind them of that when i connect with them but there's this draw about us as human beings we want to be good. Yeah. The only way we can find the good within us is through our spirituality development. And God bless us. We have this ability to rewrite ourselves. Imagine this. If you could imagine a row of these chairs and in each one, I'm seven, I'm 14, I'm 21, I'm 28, I'm 35, I'm 42, I'm 49, I'm 56, and now I'm 63. I'm, I turned 62 just a week ago. My dad just died as well, right? 
So it's all this lining up. If you could imagine each one of those different ones, you can understand this point. Every seven years of your life, you're erased. And this brand new person comes to life every seven years. This is the realm when you were chosen to finally understand God. Some of us get it at seven. Yeah. Some of us yeah. get it at 14. Some of us pick it up at 21, 28. Don't be worried about when you picked it up. It was your calling then. And look around you, Mikey. The more you're doing this, it's also linked to how much now your effort is to putting out the podcast and doing good. Spreading good. Yeah. God is amazing in its works. What's going on, guys? This video is being brought to you by Morris Andrews Solicitors. As you're all aware, we've done a season two all about crime. If you watch that all and you're in any situation like that and need help getting out of the situation, reach out to Morris Andrews Solicitors and see if it's something they can help you with. Remember, there's a defense for every offense. It is. I tell everyone it, and I don't like to be a preacher and say, oh, this is what you should do or this, but my journey so far, I thank God for everything. Every, even putting us here today, having this podcast here, this we didn't do this. We, we're not in control of our lives. He made us me. He made me send that message to you. And so I put up a story on Instagram saying, who should I get on the podcast? And someone mentioned you, messaged you. Even that person who messaged me, that's through God. Yeah. that's We're not in control of it. And the quicker people start to understand that, we don't make this. This is not us. And you hit it upon a beautiful word, control. You ever notice when people feel like their life is out of control? That's never the time that they ever turn and say, oh, thank God my life's out of control so I can turn to God. Think about that. Yeah. They're always quick to say, my life's out of control. I can't get this right. I can't go on. Yeah. They never say, oh, my God, my life's out of control. Maybe now's the time to turn to God. That's the difference in me because I was going through things like the last three years of my life I spent living in an RV in Oregon in the woods with two dogs, missing my children and my wife and writing and developing my talent and hoping for my chance. I kept telling myself, this is the toll that God has given me to pay. Why am I questioning it? Don't cry. Pay the toll because on the other side... There's all this beauty. Yeah. That translated into, I've been in England since March 19th, and since then, over 25 to 100 million people have already heard my story. God Smart. is using... You know when you actually think of them numbers? Yeah, because I had that one TikTok of video on the True Jordy come out and instantly got 5 million views, so... Yeah, I get it. Make me pay my dues so that the rewards are so beautiful. Yeah. My wife and I had a nice night because of you. We didn't want to risk the traffic over here from where she's at, where I stay. We went to a child's amusement on the seaside last night and put two pea coins in so she could try and win some sweeties because we were laughing and have a good time and we did a little driving machine but to us it was the most precious gift ever so that's what i'm talking about it doesn't matter i've known this the best work that i ever did came when i had nothing god took me and put me on stage at the Colosseum in Rome before 20,000 people in November of 2004 when I was first released to be the symbol of a happy man released from death row. I did that. That was an amazing event in my life. God took me to Geneva and stood me in front of the Human Rights Council who had just finished watching my movie, The Fear of 13, and then they allowed me to go on stage with the president of the EU and the president of Switzerland and get an ovation for who I was trying to be. God then took me and sent me into the woods to go and prove again that no matter what I go through, I still have my gift. 
I still have my heart in place. I'm still mentally here with you. I can still give. I can come back from the darkest and the most deepest loss and still show love. So should you. Because God's given you a toll. Why are you crying about the toll? Yeah. Yeah. No one ever can cries about the good times. In this coming few weeks and the next coming months, I'm going to have two television shows, two documentaries, two stage plays, and a speaking tour. It's amazing. And you've been here two months, you said? And I've only been here two months. I realized that I had to listen to God. I had a terrible tragedy happen to me in January, and I knew I had to listen to what I was being told. So I literally gave away a 32-foot motorhome to a man who had an autistic daughter and his family were living on a farm. And I gave my car away to a guy named Chris who drove me up to Washington State so I could get on an airplane. I left America with about 120 pounds, knowing it didn't matter what I had. It was who I am that was going to make it. And just to touch on one other thing here, you've mentioned it, but you haven't really dove, dived deep into it. Your kids. How many kids do you have? I have one daughter named Laura Rebecca Yaris. And recently, she's acknowledged that she knows who I am. I haven't seen her in 10 years because of the animosity with my ex. She used my daughter as a weapon against me and wouldn't let me have communications with her. She keeps acting like if I find out where or she lives, she's in peril. She forgets I was at her house to pick up papers once and then I was in the previous life. And I know where she is. I know where my daughter is. But I have to let her develop because I couldn't pull on my daughter's heartstrings. How old is she, if you don't remember? 17 now. Okay, wow. So she was born in Watford on Easter Sunday. Watford, UK, yeah? Yeah, oh, this wow. is where I first moved to, was St. Albans, uh, in 2005. And I, I lived here from 2005 to 2013. I went to Hollywood to have a movie made with my wife at that time. And she and I broke up in Los Angeles. And I came back to the United Kingdom, and I'm with my current wife, Laura, now. And she has two daughters. So mm -hmm. the daughter that Laura and I had while we first got together, named Jamie Lee, she died of Sid's death in my wow. arms after a, a nap in our flat wow. in 2016. Yeah. Sorry to hear that. It was terrible. It's really hard to deal with because it gave me deep, deep, scarred uh, dreams where I couldn't the child up you know it was really hard to deal with but I've learned so much about this journey at this point I have to keep going because I flipped the car over a year and a half well it's January of 2022 I flipped the car over and I got another concussion I now have a history of serious concussions and I have what's called chronic traumatic encephalitis of the brain so this is why a lot of the rugby players kill themselves a lot of the nfl players kill themselves is because they have a deteriorated system of plaque buildup on their brain and they go insane and kill themselves or each other or other people wow so i couldn't stay on my own anymore i had to come back to the loving arms of my wife so We've reunited, and I'm on this beautiful, romantic, healing journey, man. And I was right to do it. The crazy thing is, when I got out, my mother gave me a gift, didn't she? She asked me to be polite and yeah. respectful, and it became the tools of my neuroplasticity healing. I'm going to be the only person diagnosed with CTE to live long-term with fully functioning cognitive abilities, bro. I believe, I believe it. I'm going to beat this, and I'm going to give hope to people with CTE so other footballers and other NFL players or other people who suffer brain trauma can have hope for me because as long as I'm lucid and proving that I'm talking fluently and beautifully, they can do this, and they don't have to kill themselves. Well, the thing is, I believe it. You've done everything you have said already. Just, just, that is easy for you. 
I think so, as long as I keep going. It's easy for you. As long as you keep up this energy. This morning I received clips from the guy in, this is how crazy my life is. A guy in Australia is helping me make a, a cancer documentary about my friend in America who I met, who has taught me humility all over. My friend has been diagnosed with a cancer that only 30 people in the world ever had. The other 29 all died within six months of diagnosis. Wow. He's lived with this 12 years. So he's the one that's done it. He's the one. His wow. name just inspires so much love. To, it's just brilliant. So I meet him. I learn the story. I am part of the story because of how I met him. I meet an Australian filmmaker who's right now just put together a sizzle. We're going to take that to the investors and we're going to make a documentary that's going to blow people away. Because there's too much suffering in this world for us not to use our efforts to help others. It's apparent from mm -hmm. war to famine and everything. There's too much suffering for us not to try. You get yeah. it? Yeah. There was once a study that said that only 12 to 20% of the human population does all the good in the world. Wow. And yet it almost overwhelms us. So if that's true, I'm up the game. I like it like I'm in a competition to be the most polite, kind person in the world. I want to be the heavyweight champion of kindness. Bring your game. Let's see how you do against yeah. me. That's, that's, if that, if that's what you I'm want to be. I'm going to own it. I'm going to be the baddest kind man ever. Yeah. You know, it's even emperors have thought about this. There was one emperor who said, how could I possibly compete with Caesar, his greatness in battle and everything? And then he figured it out. The only lasting legacy I could ever leave is in my kind acts. You think about that. Your kindness makes you who you are. Your allowance of life's tragedies upon yourself is a kindness. People don't see that. Mm -hmm. Your allowance of your own suffering against the allowance of your own healing and saying, please, brother, don't suffer so hard. How many times have we comforted ourselves? We yeah. don't. We seek our comfort in other arms. I had none of that. I had to be in a cell where it was me talking to me, hoping that I could get me out of here. So I had to truly love this person for being the only one I could rely on. And you also told me that while you was in prison, you were having fights. You had 48, did you say to me? It's like almost 50 fights, yeah. So they used to make us gladiator in the cages for a sport. And they they used to thrill to it. And we, the, the, the guards. So they would bet on us. So a lot of it was monetary incentive for them and a whole lot of threats on us if we didn't win. So, yeah, I know it's hard. Like, I, I remember the, the one day that I, I fought one guy and they were just absolutely convinced I was getting mashed, that I was getting written off, you know what I mean? They were screaming at me, you're costing me money, you're costing my family money. They were threatening me, but the other guy said, you leave, you ain't got shit to say, that's my boy. <laughs> Crazy. So it was a perilous journey from the age of 20 to the age of 42 to try and not get murdered. I've been stabbed multiple times. I had multiple fights. I lived through a riot where they were burning the prison and the guards ran off and left us laughing, man. Oh, fuck, you know. Yeah, they were going to just leave us burn. They called us roaches. <laughs> yeah, 1989... Huntington State Prison was overrun with a riot where they burned B D block and they were connecting blocks and our building was going to burn. And the guards came on and said, listen up, you fucking roaches. It's barbecue time. We hope they take every one of you to fuck out. Fuck you. And then they ran off and slammed this big gate, left us. And how did it not burn down? What happened? They sent in the, uh, the military to overtake the prison. 
the National Guard came in and they whooped everything out of its cell to within an inch of its life and drug it right past my cell. Stacked them up like cords of wood out in the yard, man. They beat some of them to death. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I don't even know what to say to you anymore. You've been through hell and back and you're still here with a smile on your face with a top that says the kindness approaches. I get it. I had to learn, and it's, it is true. I had to learn that my suffering is my beauty, not because it's been taught to me from God, but it was taught to me as my only way to forgive the people who were physically doing it to me. Imagine someone cares for you every day. They come mm -hmm. in, they feed you, they change your laundry, they do everything. They're in total control. Imagine if that sinister person decides every time he comes to your door with the tray of food, he kicks it in your door and it goes flying everywhere. I had one dude do that to me over and over, twice a day, about four or five times a week for almost two years, man. Just every day. You know what I said? Thank Go you, on. Officer Daly. Meekly, humbly. How do you fight force? With love. Love for yourself not to be angry. Because everyone wants a reaction. That's it. He that's wanted it. me to blow up. That's what I mean. He Every tortured me, man. Everyone wanted you to probably go crazy so that they could end up hurting you back. In the end, they couldn't believe that I proved my self innocent and that I wouldn't get them. That they were all convinced I was going to get revenge on them. So much so, they took me off death row and they put me in a mental cell because they couldn't believe I was sane for being on death row for so long for being innocent while they was torturing me. They actually sat me in a room with a table this long and they said to me, Mr. Yaris, in recognition of the things that we did to you, we don't believe that you can come out of your cell without handcuffs and not kill one of us for what we did to you. So until the very moment they let you out of this level five prison, you ain't coming out of handcuffs and you ain't coming out of your cell. So over the last eight months, I wasn't even allowed to exercise with anyone. I wasn't allowed no one. Anybody that touched me had blue gloves on until the last minute, man, because they was terrified of me. They knew my record. They knew what I had done. But you made me do that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's madness. And the thing is, at the end of the day, no matter what you have been through, no matter what you've experienced in life, you've already told me a few things you've got lined up over the next two weeks. Your life's about to change. Your life is about, your story's about to be heard way more than 100 million times, hopefully. Yeah? And all, the only person you can thank for this is God. Because the story's insane. They're... There must be a God. Like you said to me when we first spoke, you said, my story will prove that there must be a God. And I told you, Mikey, how can I make this up? You look at it in the newspapers. From the moment God did that and struck the courthouse during my trial, after they showed pictures of what looked like an angel, I'm either completely crazy yeah. or I'm completely blessed. Some of us are chosen to bring a message around the world. I'm okay with paying the toll for my message to be shared because I've gotten people to not kill themselves, get off of drugs, stop being violent, turn away from that self-hatred, see something about themselves that makes them have hope for hanging on, and more importantly, it teaches them that in the end, you really can rewrite who you are with kindness. You can't rewrite it with money and cash and violence and anything else. The only way to do it is one, kindness. And when I figured that out, I became a superhero, and superhero. like I go out of my way to look for the next chance to be kind because that's my healing. It's more precious to me than anything because I'm trying to heal from things most people can't even get. So trust me when I tell you, I'm trying to be kind every day because it keeps my mind off of somebody raping me 
beating me, stabbing me, wanting to steal my money, ruining my relationships, stealing my child, whatever can, can be conceived of a hurt, yeah. I can erase it by being nice to that lady in the Sainsbury's whose bag is dropped. And I get a chance to talk to her, mm-hmm. not just pick the bag up. I heal. I win. I'm the baddest dude on the street. Heavyweight champ of being of kindness. World. Of the world, boy. It took an enormous amount of violence for me to understand all this. I hope I can teach people to learn this lesson without violence. That they don't need that. Well, I think this story alone, people watching this, there's going to be loads of people watching it who l- look at you as, as an inspiration now. Because there's a lot of people out there who have, like you said, PTSD. They have struggles in life. They have... Everyone has something wrong with them, yeah? And they can look at you now and think, bloody hell, if he can do it, why can't I? And that's the hope. Because I get my, my inspiration from my friend with cancer. I can't imagine living 12 years where if they cut him from the ankle to the hip and took all kind of chunks of bones out of his leg, he's perilous journey and I'm physically fit and I can be able to help. I know I was given this blessing and I live my life by a a saying of Pablo Bacasso. The meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of your life is to give that gift away. And when I thought about that, I was like, so this gift that I had to pay for with tears and suffering is mine to be a beautiful gift to give away? Then everything that they did to me no longer hurts. Yeah. I win. I, I swear, I realize there's no point in even being angry about being on death row if it's a blessing. I actually told people this for years. It's the greatest, it was the greatest adventure of my life. And you're not there no more. Mentally, even you're not there as well. So why be angry about it? Because if you, if you come out of there and you were still had that hatred towards them people, then okay, you're still living your life in that. I always say to people, don't cry over spilled milk. It's spilt. Get over it. It's yeah. That's it. You're not going to try to pick it back up. It's spilt. Bottle's empty. Done. Move on. And you've done that. You're the definition of move on with it. I know. And, okay. and now I've gotten to the point where I wonder if the milk was spilled so that I wouldn't get hit in the traffic jam ahead. So I don't get the initial reactions anymore. There are certain numbers of people who will watch this podcast will understand this one point. We're not like others. What we feel inside, we live outside. What we feel inside, we absorb from others even though it's not our crime. What we go through for the love of other people are monumental and we're we're thankless for it. We don't get the kudos over it. And that's the kind of person today who heard this podcast that I love the most in life. Dedicated sisters, mothers, brothers, cousins, friends, amazing friends who never get thanked and their friend is obtuse to the fact of how great they got it with that person in their life. That's why I love that person. Because I am I want to be that. Yeah? I think that's the best point to leave this at. Yeah. I want to be as normal as you every day because I don't have my past owning me. Mm-hmm. And I have no fears because God actually did tell me To look them in the eye. I'm still here. I think on that note, Nick, let's leave it there. Let's let everyone watch this podcast. And guys, genuinely, I'll say this to you myself. It has been amazing talking to you. you. And I think the viewers watching this as well, they're probably watching this and in just thinking, wow, wow. How can this person go through 23 years of shit? And still sit opposite me today with a smile on your face telling me I've got to fight with kindness. And 19 years of hard too. So the freedom since hasn't been always easy. But that's the first beauty of it. I don't care if it's hard or not. I'm harder than life, but I'm kinder than love. That's my saying, man. I live by that. Yeah? I hear that. Listen, it's a pleasure having you on. Guys, thank you for watching. 
Make sure you all go and follow Nick's journey as well because he's got a good journey coming up. Trust me. I believe in him and so should you. Make sure you like, comment and subscribe and I'll see you on the next episode. Thank you.